All right, welcome to another episode of Contacts with Advanced Design. Today, we are hosting two designers who um, not only have worked with us in the past, but are uh, superstars in the design industry. And uh, Michael DiTullo, thank you so much for being here. We are going to be, um, be you know, uh, Spencer Nugent is going to join us momentarily. But today is a special episode of Context. Um, because we are here to talk about politics, right? It is a very um, uncomfortable thing to talk about. It is a, what's the word? It's a, um, it's a, <laughs> it's definitely a touchy word. It's a bad word, especially if you live in, you know, the design bubble, we feel like we, our life is perfect when we live in this bubble and, and uh, we live um, surrounded by beautiful objects. But, um, you know, the reason why we wanted to reach out to Michael and Spencer is because you both have worked um, not only independently, but if you've managed teams, you worked, you worked in corporations, you worked in really big organizations and you have experience dealing with people. Um, but um, yeah, so for those who are listening, welcome uh, to Contacts. Today is November 8th. Um, yesterday, um, all of the major news outlets notified us that, you know, um, Joe Biden has was elected uh, president, the 46th president of the United States, after four years of having President Trump at the helm. We now have new leadership. Um, we now have new hope. <laughs> And uh, this is where we're at. Um, and um, I feel like it was best to get you two on board to freshly, you know, to talk about what's happening uh, around us, but also what's happening to both of you individually, because I know that this is gonna affect everyone. Um, so today's topic is, you know, design is political. And um, once in a while, someone, someone tells us to shut up about politics. Um, you know, if you want to avoid trouble, stay away from politics. You know, politics is a hot potato. You can't sell things to people that are upset or people who disagree with you. Um, but then again, you know, what is wrong with us industrial designers going out and taking a stand on something like education? Um, because we've all gone through this, you know, system of, of education here in the United States and we know how, um, fragile it is and how backwards it is. Um, we also have experienced healthcare. So why can't we take a stand on healthcare or even in industrial design? Why can't we take a stand on something like sustainable products or, or methods or, um, you know, even corporate related things like, um, you know, uh, leave of absence for if you, you know, or your wife are expecting or your partner. Um, so, you know, designers, we question and categorize, you know, a lot of things. And I think um, design requires care and love for detail, but all of that has to happen out of the box. You can't think properly, speak clearly, or write comprehensively if you can't design at all, if you're scared to upset people. So design is political and we're going to kick things off with Michael. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I think, um, like you said, it's a difficult subject for us to talk about, but I think important, more important uh, now than ever. And I think we'll continue to be important because um, the design of a lot of our systems is not working. And so it's going to take, um, you, you know, it's going to take a redesign to really figure out how we can make our systems better. And um, whether you're a designer designing objects or a designer more involved with strategy, um, you know, we can all contribute to that in terms of our, our thoughts. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it is a very touchy subject. Um, and for myself who, who have, you know, worked in industry and then now I'm in design academia, 
I think one thing that I'm always fighting for and I'm never ashamed to bring up is always talking about education because that is the space that I work in. And, you know, I, we were all students and, and, and now I'm, I'm in the position to, to be a professor and see things from the other side. And education affects us all because here in the United States, it is a pretty elitist. It's a very exclusive thing. And everything is a business and, you know, and this whole pandemic thing is really shown us how fragile the house of cards are. Um, and yeah. so one thing I do want to, um, you know, ask you, Michael, is someone who, you know, you've worked with really big companies and fortune 500 organizations, you know, like Nike and, you know, Sound United most recently. And then you also worked at really uh, smaller studios with, with really big, you know, big brands like Frog. But now you're working for yourself, right? You have your own, um, you know, independent studio. And I would love to hear about how does politics play a role in your work and in your day-to-day -day as an individual business owner? Well, you know, this is something that actually really took for granted when, when I did work for Nike. And Nike is a very political company. They're not afraid to make very public statements, um, you know, usually around athletes like Colin Kaepernick, but you know, also here in Oregon where I live, you know, Nike uh, contribute a tremendous amount to um, making sure that you know, people of all sexual orientations have the right to get married. Um, and you know, I've been really instrumental in, in helping to firm up some of the equality laws in Oregon. So it's a, it's a company that has been unafraid to um, sell things to everyone, right? I mean, they're, they're, it, it's an, you know, they, they sell inspiration um, and then they use that to uh, really kind of basically say like, this is where we think the future is going for the country and, and for the world. And I think because it is such a, um, you know, a youthful, a youthful brand, it tries to keep its finger on the pulse of that and to be on the right side of history. Not that they always get it right. Um, you know, they have some internal issues like a lot of corporations do. Um, they get it wrong sometimes, but they always try. And, um, you know, for, it's a company run by, you know, mostly a bunch of straight white guys that look like me. And so for, for myself and people that do look like me, uh, I feel like I have an obligation to, you know, put forward what I think progress looks like, right? Design is about progress. Um, and so you can't ask us to think about you know, what the progress of, you know, a smartphone is and not have our brains think about what progress looks like for the, for the world and for people. And so, you know, I feel like um, I have a duty to put that forward so that other people know, um, know that and also have, um, you know, I feel a little, have, feel maybe a little bit more safe in also putting their thoughts forward. Um, and, yeah, it's like, I don't want to use the, the overused word of like allyship, but just, you know, just putting that out into the world because it matters, you know, and showing people, you know, yeah, I could be risking business. I could be risking clients, um, but it matters to me. I, I have worked for some more conservative people and I don't want those clients. And, you know, it's very difficult. There's a, it's a totally different way of thinking, right? It's a, it's a much more shut down, um, to be honest, way of, of literal thinking. And I think if you're focused on progress, you need to be very open and, and empathic. And um, that's gonna translate into, I believe, into all aspects of your life. Absolutely. I would think a lot of designers have, you know, an ethos when they're building or they're consulting or, you know, they're building their brand. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, we should start to build also our morals into that ethos we're always talking about and always, 
you know, referencing, you know, Dieter Ram's 10 commandments of design, et cetera. And that those are his ethos. Um, but we, we never ever talk about also like our morals and, and what we believe in as humans and how everyone should. Um, I, I think that's just as important as, as, as having these, these, your standards of, of designing and your expectations. Um, that's a great point. I mean, two, two projects that come to mind that I was asked to bid on in the last four years. One was for like a e-cigarette line and the other was for a, um, like in-home Botox, like branding service design. And I was just like, I'm not, I'm not working on this stuff. You, you know, I, I don't want our brand, you know, my, my personal brand and the brand of my practice associated with these industries. Um, you know, especially speaking to the founders of the brands that were just all about there, there, there wasn't even like a, Hey, like we're going to help people like quit smoking. There wasn't any, I was trying to give them any kind of a, like uh, moral justification. And like when there isn't one, when it's just all about making money and exploiting people, you know, I have to be like, no, they're not going to bid on that. Like no quote. Why is, are you guys busy? Like, nope. That's not the reason we're just, we're not going to do this work. Yeah. And uh, you have to define those things ahead of time. Otherwise, you, you'll be, you know, you could, you could get caught making the wrong decision and then it's too late. What if, for those who are watching or listening to this episode, what if they're like, well, Michael, you went to school for design. What do you know about politics? Why don't you just stick to designing? I've heard that so many times, not only in our discipline, but I've heard that any, like that can be applied anywhere. And one example that you brought up earlier was LeBron James and other athletes and, and you know, like Colin Kaepernick who just shut up and play the game or dribble the ball. And people are so afraid um, of other people having the same right and the same power and responsibility. Like we all have the right to say whatever we, we can voice whatever we want and um, we're more than just a designer. We're more than just an athlete. And what what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's I, I think you you nailed it in that we're multi dimensional human beings. We design for human beings, and we're creative and we're expressive. So we have the right to express that. Um, and yeah, you you can't tell LeBron not to, to, to speak about what he's learned about. You can't ask Bruce Springsteen, right? You can't ask you too, not to express what they're thinking about. Um, so I think there's a, a long line of precedent for you know, athletes, creative people of all kinds um, expressing their views. And uh, I, I think, you know, I'm, for, for me, it's something that I'm passionate about um, I, I had to say I grew up in a very political family, uh, but on the conservative side, I grew up in a very conservative family. So I'm, I'm well steeped in those ways of thinking. And I think, you know, I, I was a conservative. I was much, I was much more conservative. I was raised that way. And then you go to college and you, you, you know, you meet, this is why education is so important. You know, I, I met people from all over the world in school and you start you know, getting exposed to totally different experiences at different points of view. And then, um, you know, in my, in my professional career as a designer, I traveled the world, you know, I've traveled all over Europe, all over Asia, um, not Africa yet, not South America yet, but hopefully at some point for projects. And, 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 and I think design informed my worldview. So be, because of it, you know, going to all these different places. So it's impossible not to share that back out, just like the way I would share a sketch, right? It's like, you know, it, it, it kind of comes with the territory. And, and, you know, I've had people who follow me on social media, you know, when I, when I post things, um, you know, I could see when I post more political things, sometimes follower, followers would dip down, but it's just like, that is what it is, you know, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, unless you're planning on living the rest of your life and working the rest of your life in a five mile radius of where you live, um, then by all means, 
you know, have those thoughts, think that way. But in reality, you know, humans, we're, we're a global, you know, we, we're meant to interact with people and from all walks of life. And, um, and that's what makes you happier because you experience and you learn from others. And, um, you know, the last four years have been really, I think, really tough. Um, the one thing that really, that is, is just gut-wrenching for me is um, when the, you know, when, when I started seeing families being ripped apart. Oh um, and I started to just, um, you know, there's a lot of videos online of the families reuniting, right? And after seven months or eight months of, of the kids being alone. Um, and that stuff is like, whether you have kids or not, like that should never ever happen ever, you know? Um, another thing is, is you know, uh, here in, in the United States, they, they say that you are illegal, right? right. No one is illegal. Um, you just don't have the proper documentations to be in that state, but no one in the world is illegal to anything. Yeah. Um, so it just, I think just, it just bothers me how people, how people use language as a, as a way to, to just demean and destroy communities. Um, well, even just how this, this past week, how, you know, some politicians are saying, we want to make sure that every quote unquote legal vote is counted. You know, they're inserting language that insinuates things. And, um, you know, there's an old saying, if you want to make a criminal, make a law. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're criminalizing existence. And uh, I mean, I, I, I read a lot. I love to read about the world and about politics. I also read, if you know this as my friend, I read a tremendous amount of uh, science fiction. And I remember uh, a client of mine who, who knew, knows I love science fiction sent me this, this book um, where they're dealing with aliens in the, it takes place in New York City, it was written in the 80s. They're dealing with aliens in the book. It's not until halfway through the book that you realize the aliens they're talking about are just people who are, are out, not citizens. And so the, 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 the literature plays a mind trick on you. They get you to kind of like empathize with these aliens. And then you realize the aliens are actually humans. It's just the language has gotten so out of control. Yeah. That, I mean, what you're describing is Native Americans, you know, and, and us coming into this sacred land and making it our own. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's been uh, quite a roller coaster ride, an emotional roller coaster ride. Um, you know, now we are, are to shift, you know, the, com the conversation over. We're, we're being joined now by Spencer Nugent. Spencer, thank you so much for being here. Um, hey, Hector. Like I mentioned before, to kick things off, you know, we have Michael and Spencer here who, who both have experience working in companies, you know, in organizations, managing people, dealing with people from all walks of life. And now they're, they're working independently. Um, and uh, today's topic is design is political. Um, you know, the, ma the majority of the time we're told to shut up and just design and, and, um, but yeah, it's it's 2020, and uh, we're we're entering a new phase in in here in America. And I would love to hear from you, Spencer, since you're joining us, on what this means to you as a designer based in Utah. Um, but not only that, as a you know a very um, a very excited and full of energy, you know, a human being. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on how, how what this means to you. Thanks, man. Uh, full of energy. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday was was interesting for me um, as we record on the day after the announcement was made about um, the outcome of the election. I I wasn't sure how it was going to go. Honestly, I think part of what happened for me was just 2016. It, it, 
it was traumatic. It was traumatic. I remember the day I went into work and there was just this air of gloom and it wasn't just me. There were many people um, experiencing that. So I think for me, there was a delayed response almost like, okay, is this really happening? Is this, am I okay? Am I safe to celebrate? <laughs> you know? And as the reports came in um, to answer your question, the meaning has been happiness. The meaning has been manifesting itself in a, in a feeling of uh, relief. You know, I'm, I'm also a single father. I parent full time on my own. And there have been times this year where I've had to apologize to my kids and just say, I'm so sorry. The world is this way. I'm so sorry. People are so hateful. I'm so sorry. The president said this, you know, things like that. And some people may hear that and go, well, why are you telling your kids about what's happening? I think it's important for them to understand the world they live in. You know, and and just because they're kids doesn't mean they they can't appreciate certain things. Um, and as much as they kids can learn to hate, you know, they they can learn from I think our example and um, be included in these conversations. I think they're capable of that. So anyhow, it's been I I told my kids yesterday what happened. <clears throat> One of them asked me, "So what's Joe Biden going to do?" And I said to him, "Well." I don't know, but hopefully I don't have to apologize to you guys for things he's saying. I hope that we can all, as a society, do a little bit better. I hope we can all level up. I hope we can be more inclusive, more loving, more compassionate. I hope we can show more empathy, is what I said. But also the reality is I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But um, definitely... You know, for us, as 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 you put it, Hector, you know, living in Salt Lake City, Utah, we're we're a little bit of an island of uh, diversity where I am, and I'm okay with that. But I'm also a bit on edge, admittedly, as I do wonder how my neighbors will react to me showing any sign of happiness at this moment. Um, I actually I took down some signs from my yard. I'm trying to just be just lay low, keep it chill. Because <laughs> unfortunately, as a Black person, one of the things I have to be aware of and mindful of is how I carry myself and whether or not I'm, up I'm uh, upsetting a white person, at least where I live, because I don't want to be harmed or uh, punished for that. Okay, so there's my long answer for your <laughs> simple question. Sorry about rambling there. I'm so sorry that you have to edit yourself to be safe and it's just not right. You know, that, that's a great way of putting it. Um, it. It's editing ourselves and it's not something unique to me. Uh, I know my sister, uh, many other black friends, we, we do that, we edit ourselves. We have to almost make a determination in whatever context and whatever context we find ourselves in, like decide, okay, is what I'm about to say going to upset these people? <laughs> Will my point of view be appreciated or am I going to be questioned and scrutinized for thinking differently? Is my experience going to be validated, my point of view, um, coming from, you know, my lived experience? So these are all things I have to certainly think about. And that's, that's something that before you joined, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, if corporations, if capitalism in general benefits from our thinking differently, right? That, that, that is what separates us as designers and, and that's the contribution that they're looking for. Well, then that has to be accepted, whether it's you know on a product concept or anything else that you're bringing to the table based on who you are. And, and um, that's just gotta be the way it has to, to be moving forward. I, I think at least that's where I think, I hope that we end up at some point. Yeah, one, one thing I've learned in my career, Michael, to piggyback on that is you, you mentioned this, at least this is how I'm interpreting it, that, and, and in light of the topic of the podcast, design is political, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to say it, it's impossible for us to separate ourselves from who we are and in the design process, like the work we do is an outcome of who we are and that's okay. <laughs> You know, it's okay to, I think, advocate for change and for good as a designer. Um, certainly, depending on your position, your status, your influence, the stage you are in your career, that 
that's going to be uh, your work will be more impactful or less impactful. But I think I think it's time. I think it's time for design to advocate for change. As a society, we wouldn't be where we are without great minds. We wouldn't be where we are without people coming together. So great minds and people coming together sounds like a, a, a design task uh, worth tackling. Um, and for a lot of my career, I, I did kind of shut up. I did kind of, you know, lay low. I will make an admission on this podcast that I am left leaning, but for the majority of my life, I actually was conservative. You know, I grew up in a conservative uh, household and um, certainly religiously minded and it's taken some time, but as I've thought for myself as a designer and, and in, the, in the context of my job, okay, my job is to improve the world. Um, I, I found myself certainly aligning with the left more than the right. And um, even feeling that, and again, the tension between what I thought I needed to do as a designer, which is shut up, <laughs> And how I was feeling inside, I, I couldn't take it anymore. This year was really the, the point, the breaking point for me. Um, you know, George Floyd, Richard Brooks, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and many, many others. That's kind of what, um, you know, was, was just too much. It was too much for me to take and just be silent as um, someone in our industry who has, and much like you, Michael and Hector have that influence and platform to be able to speak up. So I did. And there was a lot of fear for me at first. I thought, oh, I'm going <laughs> to, people are going to hate on me for this. I remember once I, I think I ranted on my Instagram about designers and uh, the environment and that we could do better. And one of my fans was like, I'm not here for politics. Bye. And it made me like, you know, wince a little bit like, oh, <laughs> But I realized, no, for that one voice that was dissenting, there were 50 others that were like, oh, thank you. I appreciate your words. Thanks for, you know, pointing us out. And that that made me feel like, okay, I can speak up. I can share who I am. Um, and I think there's some value to that as designers and speaking up and being genuine, being ourselves and not merely playing the role of designer, but like showing your personality and your views and your opinions. I don't think we necessarily need to separate those things. And it, it gives me hope because we both went on that journey. And I also grew up in a very conservative household and was conservative when I was younger because that's just what I knew. And you know, the, the more experience I gained, the more I learned about other people, the more you just kind of open yourself up to progress and their, their other people's lived experiences and so at least gives me hope that, you know, that you went through, you went through um, a journey, I went through a journey. So we know it can happen. And, and we know that the more people learn, the more they experience, the more they lower that fear, the more they lean towards progress. And um, I keep using that word because it's, you know, progressive, it's called progressive politics for a reason, right? It's like, because we're not happy with where we are right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm happy that at we least, have progress. at least half the country is is uh, <laughs> not happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we have made progress, you know, and, and we have made progress and, and but it's like we will continue to do that. And, you know, I mean, we celebrated pretty heavy yesterday and we were really excited, but that was just the start, right? Like now there's a tremendous amount of pressure that we all to keep need to continue to, to bear, put to bring to bear on this new administration to make sure that they keep moving us as, as far as they can, as fast as we can. Um, and, you know, I mean, my partner and I will be volunteering to, for the runoff elections for Georgia. Um, awesome. You know, there's just, there's, there's things that we can do. Uh, you know, not all of us get to design like the Obama hope poster like Shepard Ferry did. But, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't volunteer to call people in Georgia to make sure that they're they're set to vote in the January 5th election. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Spencer, before you joined us, we were talking about, you know, as designers, we all kind of have our little like ethos, our principles for design. And um, but we never bring up our morals and we never talk about maybe we should be merging our morals and our ethics together when 
when we are designing for a client or a potential, you know, a client who, who's interested in, in your work and wants to hire you, but maybe they are super conservative, conservative or, or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, one example that I can think of, and this is something that I've shared with you, Spencer. Um, I don't think I've shared this with many people, but I remember when I had just graduated from school, um, my very a couple of, I think it was my second job out of school, I got hired to consult at a toy invention firm in Chicago. Um, sounds very exciting. And it was very exciting up until the end. Um, I was designing toys for about six months up until the last project where the, my boss was like, Hey, we're going to put you on this project and you have to sign on this paperwork. Um, but essentially what you're going to be designing is not a toy and it is a weapon to control, to do crowd control during protests. And being the 23 year old naive designer who had just recently graduated into a recession, I was just, I did what I was told and I was like, okay, this is part of my job and I just got to do it. No questions asked. And I was a part of the, de the design team that designed it, that engineered it and things like that and did a lot of CAD. And um, I think when, when for me, when shit hit the fan is when we, I, I just saw how fast they prototyped this thing. And in my mind, I was like, oh, this is gonna take forever. And as soon as they prototyped the thing, I think that's when my skin started to crawl and we took it out to the, range and they have these huge like gels these pieces of gels and and the, the bullets were just penetrating through the gels every test was failing and i think that was when i started to be like oh fuck what have i done i was a part of a team but i think everyone always blames you know yourself you start feeling guilty um because you start asking yourself I should have said no, or I, this, I could have done something else, but this is my job. And you start questioning yourself. Um, and it was awful. It was an awful thing. I think after that, I didn't work. I, I think after a couple of weeks, I left that job because I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. The weapon was ended up, it was, it, it ended up getting a contract with the, Dep the department of defense. Um, this is actually public information now. So you can actually Google this and um, it turns out that the owner of the company ended up shutting down the toy business to focus on the weapon aspect of this. Um, I'm not going to say any names, but it, it was a little traumatizing because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I would love to hear about both of you. I know, Michael, you spoke a little bit about that, but I don't know if you have any other stories about, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, you do take things because it is a job and, and, you know, obviously money is money. And sometimes you don't know, obviously I was, I was, we're all a little bit naive and sometimes you don't understand until you go through things. Um, we'd love to hear about that because even that is political, right? So. Yeah. The first um, consultancy I ever worked for, actually, there were two projects that um, were ethically touchy and I really appreciated how, the two partners basically brought them to everybody and we're like, Hey, we've been asked to pitch on these two projects. And they're like, here's, you know, what we think the pros and cons of them are. And then they had to let everybody vote, you know, on like whether we should pursue them or not. Um, and in, in both cases, we pursued them. One, one was for um, a firearm, but it had an innovative locking mechanism to present, prevent more, accidental firings and we we decided to take it only because of that it was about making it safer uh, and the other was for a piece of protective eyewear for the military and again we're like we're only taking this because it's about basically saving the site for these 18 19 year old kids who are like you know going into these into war um but it was, you know, we took in them with trepidation and we also really decided like we, we defined where the boundary was, right? We weren't going to work on anything that had the intention to hurt. But I, I think that 
even though what you went through was was traumatic, Hector, I think what you took out of it was positive in that, you know, it, it, it formed a hard boundary for you, you know, and so you know, if you had kept working there and or kept doing more things like that, that would have been bad. But instead, you you're like, I don't want to do this. And, and I think that takes a lot of courage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, for me, for me, my experience, you know, I can kind of relate to uh, I, I did take a job a while. I think it was it was for some accessories for a rifle or something. I think it was some enhanced sight um, uh, computer vision system or something like that uh, that would attach to a gun. And I did it. Um, and after I did, it, I just felt sick. <laughs> You know, but, but granted, it was too late. I don't know what became of the project. I don't know how many people have resulted in the death of, uh, or how many people have been a casualty of that enhanced design. But I would certainly hope. Um, I hope it's. I hope it's not. You know, something that's that's adversely affects a lot of people. But I can totally relate to that. And you know, you talk about morals, Hector, and ethics, and making sure that as designers, we, and that the term I think of is have integrity, yes. which I suppose is topical to what I saw over the last four years, but I'll just speak on integrity for a bit. Integrity being uh, the alignment of our actions with our morals and values. Okay. Yes. So what I, what I see in this state where we're also divided, um, clearly divided, from each other is a tendency for people to um, compromise on what they what they say are their values um, or purport their <laughs> for their values to be um, without being specific. But if I want to cause trouble for a bit, I would say, um, you know, just as an example, evangelical Christians, um, in my experience, have been very vocal advocates for, you know, let's say, for example, uh, preventing abortions, okay? Um, and not just preventing, but removing the right for a woman to choose what to do with her body. And I go, okay, cool. That's your platform. That's your, your position. And certainly there's some nuance and discussion that could happen there. But what I saw in 2016 was a majority, um, or rather, a large group of people who, again, were quite content to be on their moral high ground and criticize those who would champion a woman's right to choose. Vote for a man who literally said, you know, if you want to just quote unquote, well, I'm going to paraphrase and move on a bitch and grab her by the pussy. It's like, yeah, you can do that. And people would like twist and contort their minds and you know, put aside their cognitive dissonance and do mental backflips and just say, yeah, let's vote for him. He, and, that, and not just, hey, I don't want to kill babies, so I'm going to vote for this guy. From that to we actually support and he's called by God and chosen. Like, that's the kind of language I was seeing. And so it, it, it was sad for me to see people compromise on their values. All right. So that's that's the general public. In terms of designers themselves, um. I've, I've seen people come out and speak up and that's been encouraging. I've seen people um, decide to act with integrity with regards to how they use their platforms and influence, um, whether it's in taking a stand. We saw designers and engineers leave Facebook because they were morally opposed to the way they were doing business and Facebook's reluctance to literally stop lies from being spread. Um, and it, there's just, there's so many thoughts in my head because so much has happened literally in the last year. Um, it feels like we've lived through four years in one year, but, um, those are just a few things top of mind when it comes to values and morals. It's like, you can't on one hand set aside your values and morals and criticize me, <laughs> um, for supporting a woman's right to choose, right? That doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, I think you called out something there, Spencer, a little bit in that really calling out, I think one of the things that 
I won't say I like to do, but I tend to do is I really like to call out when there's a separation between the words and the actions. And so, you know, when somebody tells me they're pro-life, I'll just be like, great. So I guess you're for gun control. You want to stop wars and the death penalty. Uh, let's limit mass incarceration so that people can have their lives. Oh, well, no, I don't want any of those things. I just want to stop abortion. Well, I, I guess you're not really pro-life then. You know, you're, you're just against a woman having rights. And so, you know, calling out those separations, it's like when people say like, I'm all for freedom and democracy. Well, great. I guess you're against the electoral college because the electoral college is a holdover from a compromise in the constitution with slave states so that slave states could have more power. Right, it's, it's, it's limiting direct democracy. And if you're about democracy and you're about freedom, then we should just go with the popular vote. And you know, we have in, in 2016, we had a candidate that won by 3 million votes. In 2020, we had a candidate that won by over 4 million votes. And we're still sweating over a few thousand votes in very specific parts of the country. The, the design of our systems needs to be relooked at so that it can align with the words that we use. You know, I think when the country was formed, the words were very aspirational, but we weren't there, we weren't even close to there <laughs> yet. And so, you know, we've gotten closer, but we have the ability to get much further down the road. And, you know, I think if the last four years has taught us anything, it should have taught us that we need to really reform and improve the way we even, you know, select um, our leadership. You know, I mean, I said this on Instagram the other day, but it's like, you know, every state has two senators, another holdover from those, those compromises in the constitution with slave states. So you have a senator like Kamala Harris from California, the fifth, the fifth largest economy in the world, the highest tax paying state in the world, the most populous state in the world, who has the same amount of power as you know, Mitch McConnell mm -hmm. from a much smaller state that's, you know, it's, it's, it's just not, it's not fair. And it is, we can make it more fair. We have the ability to do that. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm not a huge proponent for design being the solve for everything, but I don't know, maybe, maybe creative people do need to get more involved with some of these um, think tanks to push things along. So as, as much as we all love the memes and we all love, you know, uh, there's been some great memes, by the way, as much as we all, you know, these memes. Oh man, the, the internet's been on fire this week, man. <laughs> of, you know, the, you know, making fun of Trump and, and, and all of the other politicians, et cetera. At the end of the day, we have to move forward. Um, and I think Biden said it best yesterday that we need to be a United States of America. Um, because at the end of the day, we do have to coexist with everyone, whether you are independent or left or right or whatever, whether you're from Mars or Jupiter, it doesn't matter. We need to coexist with each other. What, what happens next? Um, and how do we how do we how do we do that together? Um, because in four years we're going to be facing the same BS again, and then in four years, and it's not nothing is going to change um, un unless we un us individuals start making those changes ourselves to to be more inclusive, um, to to listen to each other. Um, because I think we could co coexist, um, but if, if we don't do something then this is going to happen every four years it's always going to be this it's going to build up to november of 2024 and november of 2028 and i don't want to live like that that <laughs> sounds like i'm gonna get a tumor or something <laughs> i agree or aneurysm or just a stroke or something <laughs> but i i've thought a lot this election season and i have I, admittedly i haven't uh, read Ezra Klein's book um, about why we're, why we're so polarized, or I think it's uh, Talking to Strangers. I forget which one, but in any case, I haven't made it all the way through, but I have been thinking about this, that f there are many shared values that we have, and sometimes we forget, you know, because 
someone may hone in on something, whether it's uh, reproductive rights or the environment or how we do business and go, well, I don't want higher taxes. Cool. All right, let's level up a little bit. Do we both agree that uh, being able to, to have commerce is a good thing? Cool. Do we agree that roads are important and education and, okay, how do we fund those things? Well, the more successful we are, the more room we create to support these structures, whereas people on the other side go, well, no, it's all about me, myself, and I. Um, so I've kind of honed in on this idea and just in my thinking, and I realized that others have been thinking this as well. We're just kind of in this age of hyper-individualism where many people do not care about their brother or sister, Right. I'm going to go a step further, <laughs> and I love you, Michael, but I think it's something endemic to people who aren't minorities yeah. in the sense that minorities, we have to come together when it's time for us to level up. We're used to this. We're used to working together, building up. Outside of my people, my culture, and others, and what I see is just this really just selfish approach to life, and you know, Michael, you're a business owner. I'm a business owner. Hector, you own, you run a nonprofit, but also have run businesses. And it's like, yes, we pay taxes. We get it, <laughs> right? But I'm not okay with um, people suffering because I got my extra half percent, you know, saving here or there. Uh, to, to me, that that that's an example of where my morals and values say, okay, I can make room for this. Sure, it would be nice to buy another you know, brand new iPhone this year, or it'd be nice to, you know, put away 500 bucks, whatever. Or I don't know, maybe I could be more creative or do something else. I don't know. But I, I look at that and I just, I just kind of hurt at seeing how selfish people are. Going a bit further, <laughs> as I, as I try to remain, uh, maintain rather some malleability in my thinking and approach and objectivity and just looking at the world, even being on the left, I look at the arguments that are made for a more conservative approach to the economy or life in general, many of these things. And, and frankly, what people are afraid of, you hear it in the words of the president, he's still the president, you hear it in his words as he tries to come, uh, motivate people from a place of fear and fear of what? Maybe you guys talked about this already, but as I heard him say, they are coming for your suburbs. Yeah. My first question is, okay, who is he speaking to? A crowd of white people, cool. So who are these they he's talking about? You know, it's a dog whistle. It's meant to say they, and, and we've seen policies implemented. He's already, and I hope that the, the new administration reverses this, but removed requirements for low income housing or I don't even want to call it low-income housing. I'm going to call it more accessible housing, right? For people. He's removed requirements um, that were in place to allow for more opportunities for housing in, in better areas. And I know for, for me as a father that where I live impacts even the likelihood of success for my children in terms of education. So these are real opportunities that are being taken away from people like myself the they, the other, <laughs> right? The people that don't look like the crowd. That makes me sad. But back to my main point, it seems to me that there is, uh, there is a difference in opinion, not necessarily on what we want, but what it means um, and how we get there. So yes, we all want freedom. I, I would hope we want to prosper in some way. I want to bring people with me. Okay. And many of my friends do. We want to make the world a little bit better for everyone else. But as I listen to people, I hear, ah, oh, the first reaction to, or some of the first reactions to, to President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris is, oh man, just wait till your taxes go through the roof. It's like, literally, is that all you care about? Is your taxes right now, literally. And historically speaking, we are in an era of very, very low taxation. That's frankly just not sustainable, right? I mean, it's kind of ironic because, you know, as the saying goes, like to, they want to make America great again. And it's, this it's money over bodies, Michael. That's, that's yeah. the platform. Yeah. They're not saying it, but it's right. money oh, over yeah. bodies. You look at the way the pandemic's been handled, how a quarter of a million 
deaths is considered an acceptable loss that they're throwing their hands up and saying there's we're not going to stop this pandemic the president in march exacerbated the problem of people not wearing masks because he refused to wear a mask it emboldened people it he led by example albeit a bad example undermined experts and science and 70 million people or a large percentage of them believe the bullshit he was saying they believe that this virus is a hoax like it's completely irresponsible for him to do things like that right yeah words matter words matter they want to harken back to this you know mythical time uh with through make america great again great again for who though (laughs) and and you look at those times in the 50s and 60s well the the nominal tax rate for the highest richest americans was 90 percent um you know is that what they want you know that's how we funded roads that's how we put people on the moon no what they want is is pretty that's clearly not what they want right what they want is a more racist, more divided America. Um, and I, I totally agree with, with your comment about that selfishness is a, a, a feature of white America. And that's because that, that privilege is built over generations, right? So you can, af- you can essentially afford to be selfish. And um, we, we've demonized civic mindedness over the last 40 years. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I think we need to lead by example and, and shift that to be more um, focused on, you know, what can we do to, to make our country better to move forward? Um, and you're right. I mean, we do need to bring people along. Um, I don't, I struggle. Like how, what's the balance between bringing people along and just nothing happening? You know, I don't know. I think one thing that I do, um, you know, like about us, us three, um, you know, we're a part of Offsite, which is this new education initiative that we started together. And one thing that you're going to quickly learn about education and you being responsible for someone else's education as you're the instructor, um, you're going to quickly realize that you need to set all of these differences, you know, you got to set them to the side and your job as an educator and professor is to teach them equally, regardless of whether they believe X, Y, and Z. For the last three years, the last four years, I've been teaching in Indiana at the University of Notre Dame. Then I started to teach in the evenings at Indiana University in South Bend in the campus there. And the students are from rural America and probably have never seen someone like myself. And you have to go in with no judgments and that's not your job. Your job is to prepare them and to teach them um, regardless of what their belief is, who they believe in. um, And your job is their success. And I think that is, I think that is one thing that I've learned about being an educator is is just be nice to everyone, um, regardless if a student comes into your class and he has a, you know, Trump sticker slapped on their folder. Um, that is not your job. Your job is to just be an all around good human being um, because they rely on you and, and you know, you're, you're an educator. And um, that has taught me a lot because I, I was a little different before being in academia, I was just like, you know what? I live in a big city, Chicago. I don't have to deal with these people. I don't have to, if someone doesn't look like me or doesn't have the same, you know, think the the same way, then so be it. I live in an urban, I don't, I don't, I would have to go out of my way (laughs) to interact with people, but um, life is really strange and you just have to uh, just be nice to everyone. Um, And that's kind of my takeaway. You know, James, James Baldwin, um, writer, activist, thinker, way ahead of his time, he said, we can all disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of humanity and right to exist. So, yeah, it, it's incredibly difficult and <laughs> challenging to have these discussions, you know, like you said, 
um, time and place perhaps to have that discussion. Maybe not uh, my job as a, an educator here to necessarily impose my point of view on a student, but I, I, I think it's with it, well within my responsibility to question or rather to invite critical thought. Mm -hmm. So my approach tends to be, you know, in earnest, trying to understand the other person's perspective. Hey, I noticed you've got that Trump sticker. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, what do you love about him? Cool. Let's have a discussion. Oh, okay, cool. You love that. Uh, you feel as you feel like you're going to be more economically successful. Help me understand where you're coming from here. And, you know, maybe they'll highlight some things and I can say, well, on the flip side, you might consider this. Right. And then that for me invites at least some discussion. I can, I can, Fair. be comfortable with having small wins along the way as far as dialogue and discussion goes but it is it is difficult it is very difficult when someone is championing a human or cause frankly and yes this is biased of me to say but i do hope the republican party fades into non-existence i really do it's time to put away sexism racism xenophobia hyper individualism and economic increase at all costs it's it's time you know, we're better than that as people. I know this is a fantasy, but for those who know Star Trek and that whole utopian society, I love how uh, forward thinking Gene Roddenberry was in, in considering and contemplating, hey, you know, what, what, what would a world be like without conflict, at least amongst ourselves as humans? If humanity were united, certainly there's conflict at large to help the story move forward. But what if we were all united? What if money wasn't a thing? What if instead of incarceration, we rehab rehabilitated people? You know, I love what Oregon's doing um, in taking a more thoughtful approach to helping people be better humans. Like that, that makes me feel just optimistic that we, we're, we are willing to try some different things and do better. Um, and I suppose from a design perspective, <laughs> I'll just wrap on this one point as from a design perspective, I, I would, I would be, I would probably be the person um, to advocate for like widespread change, you know, blow shit up. Let's start again. Um, kind of like you would in a design project that just isn't working. This is a design exercise that is not working. And sometimes when you have a tumor, you got to cut it out. You can't, you know, continue to, to, to go with your current course. Sometimes it's metastasized so much that you just have to you have to take some extreme measures. So hopefully we, hopefully we continue to do better, man. Hey Spencer, not to, not to make you the, the avatar and sage for all dads everywhere. But <laughs> you're the only one of us on this that, that has kids. What do you, do you think that there's any, um, I mean, coming out of 2016 to 2020 and COVID and you know, your, your boys are having an experience that's so different than maybe anything else ever. And, and I feel like heroes are, are different. Like we're seeing like the po postman is like a hero now, right? Do, do you think that generationally, like there would be potential for people to be more, for young people to be like, hey, I don't wanna go into the private sector. I actually wanna go into government. And, and, and cause that's, you know, I see all the time in young designers, like I wanna change the world. I'm like, well, then you should go into government, you know? <laughs> What do you think about that? Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, I think some of that. Well, I get, I guess I can speak to um, my role as a parent. I I don't advocate for my children to be anything outside uh, what they innately want to be or gravitate toward. I don't want to um, steer their life necessarily away or toward things. You know, I'm a designer today because my parents allowed me to choose. They encouraged. Um, had I followed their encouragement, I'd be a computer scientist, probably making a shit ton of money, but <laughs> and doing okay. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be feeling as fulfilled as I do now, and I want them to feel that. So, I would certainly encourage and hope that they would either be engaged in career pursuits that um, can, if they so desire, result in widespread change. I'd be thrilled, absolutely thrilled if, if my kids got into um, some space where they could <laughs> make those um, changes, you know, politics would be would be interesting. But um, as far as hope in general goes, yeah, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the next generation will 
and and you can see it if you talk to I, I don't even know what the generation is now i'm starting to feel like an old fart but if you talk to young kids today right the majority of them are just like no what why why are so many people supporting this orangutan like what it doesn't even make sense to them <laughs> you know racism doesn't make sense to my kids sexism things like like even i mean frankly religion doesn't make sex it makes sense to them right now and that's okay i'm like okay cool um if you wanted to get involved i would support you absolutely and again encourage thought and dialogue and hey tell me more about your faith but that being said i am pumped for future generations i thought michael and hector i thought and i hoped that my generation our generations x through millennial i guess um or even zennial whatever would be the ones to say enough is enough no more we're done with this this bullshit racism xenophobia sexism and just uh the subjugation of less fortunate people and capitalization on their literally in some instances on their bodies i thought we would be the ones to put an end to that but i don't think we will be I think we've we've made some cracks, we've made some waves, and I think there. I'm so excited for my kids to grow up in a better world. I really am, because it will be better. Absolutely, those people who are resistant to change and fearful of us, them coming into our neighborhoods, and I suppose that's one reason I do enjoy being in Utah because I am one of those others now. It's like I've root, I've I've taken root in your neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm a successful black man and I'm here. Deal with it, you know. So I, I, I wish I could. And, you know, just the nature of life is we don't last forever. But I wish I could be there when my kids are older and see how beautiful the world would be, because I think we are going to head. We're going to get there. Um, it's going to be painful for a lot of people. One thing that is concerning right now um, is any creature on the brink of its existence will lash out. Mm -hmm that's the most dangerous time for that creature and the creature of white supremacy and people who hang on to these archaic ideas, that creature, that organism, that entity is going to flail. It is going to hold on in whatever way it can. And you're starting to see these conversations happening online or amongst even friends of mine about the civil war that's going to happen. I, th I think they almost want that to happen. I feel as though um, there are going to be death throes Right. And we're going to have to deal with that. Our generation is going to have to deal with that. So I'm excited for my kids because we're the ones who are going to have to bear the brunt of the death of this organized or organism. Um, they're going to reap the benefits. We're going to have to deal with it. Yeah. That's a great, it, you know, before a star dies, it goes supernova. Right. And then once it goes, yeah, that's, that's also a great, yeah. great way to put it. Absolutely. Once it goes supernova, it collapses in on itself. I, I hope we have, I hope we have seen the supernova and we'll start to see the collapse because yeah, if it does progress to something more, just more people will hurt. Right. And I get, I, I get that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are, are so many of us are hurting. There's such high unemployment. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I, I feel like so many people have been convinced to misdirect and blame that hurt on the wrong group of people. Um, and, and I think that's what we have to address. And I mean, I, I'm not the biggest, uh, you know, Biden fan. I wanted to, you know, I know you guys, you know, I think all three of us wanted to push harder, faster, but perhaps one silver lining about him is, is maybe of all of those candidates, maybe he has the most ability to kind of bring some of those other folks along. Um, and, and certainly, you know, following up with a great VP pick in, in Kamala, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm hopeful because certainly for the past four years have been a huge wake up call for, for people like me who are comfortable, successful white liberals, right? Who thought like, oh man, after like two Obama terms, like we got this in the bag and, and I'll never forget where I was in 20, on the 20, in the 2016 election, I was on a business trip and, and my partner she was like, I don't want you to travel during the election. And I was like, oh, come on, this is like 100% sewn up. Like, this is going to be totally fine. And I was uh, in an engineering lab all day in Baltimore. And then at night, I took my team, you know, it's five or six of us were, were in a bar to watch the election results come in. And we just all started crying. You know, we're just hugging each other, crying, 
they get a FaceTime from, from Christina to like get held back to your, your hotel room right now so we could FaceTime. And it was a, a, a slap in the face, a punch in the gut and a bucket of cold water over my head all at the same time. And I think, you know, I think that hopefully I inspired us to get much more involved in donating and doing things. And, and hopefully it did a lot that for a lot of people. And hopefully that work doesn't stop because we can't be complacent. You know, pro, the only way to coast is down and to continue to make progress, we have to force it. Absolutely. Um, well, I really appreciate both of you coming on to Contact to share your thoughts and your emotions as the election is literally like fresh in our minds. Um, you know, we're always talking about politics in our personal channels. Um, and uh, it was just the right timing for us to bring it to the surface and talk about it in a public forum um, because we can and we should, and we have influence and, you know, there's people who, you know, like for example, at Offsite, you guys teach students that are scattered all over the world, all different views of religion and politics, and they trust you guys and they love you guys. And I think we can coexist. So any parting words would be fantastic as we wrap up this podcast. I think I'd, I'd say uh, for my parting words, it's like, you know, we're gonna we're celebrating right now and and next week we have to get back to work and you know just just like a designer in the process as as um citizens as people who are part of the civic process you know it's we can't just cast a vote and and be done we need to keep working and and we need to find joy in that work yeah i think uh, i appreciate your words michael and, and hector um from my perspective, a few things are top of mind, have been top of mind, and will be top of mind. Um, I, in the last four years, I've I've tried to always make room to understand as much as I can the other side. You know, be willing to have a conversation. Don't just shut people down unless your disagreement's rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity, then we're not really going to have a conversation. But if we can start from that common ground, we're all human here. Um, we, we often have shared values and I think there are many productive conversations to be had. And I look forward to that and would encourage people to have those conversations. The other thing is to just seek to seek to understand others. You know, this is a, a movement, not a moment. That's the other thing that's that's been top of mind. Movement, not moment. So don't lose momentum. Uh, be passionate. And I, I hope that the energy that came with this round of people registering to vote and being concerned and actually showing up will continue. The fact is, whether you like the Electoral College or not, <laughs> there were four and a half million people. That's a lot of people that said no. This is not the way we, we need to be. And I suspect there would have been even more because there are people I know that didn't vote, right? So I would encourage you to stay involved, care, and do what you can. Turn your privilege, if you have it, into power, into action. Make it make a difference. Thank you, both of you. Thank you for coming on to Context to share your thoughts and your insights. Um, for those who are listening, thank you so much for your continued support. We are going to publish this as soon as possible, and we'll make the video available for those who want to see it. Um, but thank you so much, Michael and Spencer, and uh, like you both, like both of you said, um, you know the work starts now, right? Like obviously we're celebrating, or and where things are, are moving in a great direction, but it's time to get to work. And um, yeah, everyone, be safe. Take care and until the next episode. So thank you both, Spencer, Michael, take care. Thanks, Hector. Thank you.